Okay. So, congruent figures. Um, we've talked about congruent segments and angles. We can have all sorts of different congruent figures. Um, so, congruent figures are figures are, that are the same size and shape. Okay. Um, and since they're the same um, size and shape, that means all of the corresponding sides and angles are going to be congruent. Okay, so, you know, all the sides being the same length means they're going to be the same size, and then all the angles being congruent would, would give you the same shape. Okay, so rigid transformations, I meant to underline this here, rigid transformations just mean um, going from one figure to another, like in this, these, uh, these um, triangles I have down here, going from one figure to the other, that it maintains the same size and shape. From the pre-image to the image. So let's say this is the pre-image, that's the image. Well, they're the same size and shape, okay? So since they're the same size and shape, that means the pre-image and the image are congruent. That's what congruent figures means, right? That they have the same size and shape, okay? So examples of rigid transformations um, is everything we've done so far. So translations, where you're just sliding the figure around, it's not going to change size or shape. It's not going to change size or shape if you reflect it over um, a line. So that's going to, a reflection counts, and so does a rotation. It's not going to change size and shape if you rotate it. Okay, so all of the transformations we've done so far are considered rigid transformations. That's just not supposed to be there. Okay, all right, so next up, um, we've got an example here. Make a congruent statement for the triangle. So first, let's look at these two triangles. I can see, hey, all of the angles are congruent from one figure to the next. A is congruent to F, C is congruent to E, B is congruent to D, and then the same thing with the sides, right? They all have corresponding parts in the other triangle that are congruent. So I can say that these entire triangles are congruent to one another, okay? Now a congruent statement, you just want to say, well, what triangle is congruent to what triangle? So here's my congruent statement. I'm going to name the first triangle however I want. I'm going to call this triangle ABC. You could call it triangle CBA if you wanted to. It doesn't have to be alphabetical, right? I can choose what order as long as it's those three, um, those three um, vertices there, okay? My congruent statement, I want to say, well, what is this congruent to? And here's where you have to be careful. So it's easy to assume, oh, I went alphabetical, so I'll just say it's congruent to DEF. But it's not going to work like that. So in this first position, in this first slot, I put the letter A. Okay, so then I'm thinking, well, what is congruent to A? So I have to look over here, and it's not actually D, it's F. Okay, so I need F to be in the same slot as the A was, because those are the congruent parts. Okay, and then I'm going to do the same thing with the B. So the B, let's see, that has the three dashes, so that's going to be congruent to D. So I want B and D to be in the same slots. Okay, and then C and E are the final pieces, so those should be in the same slot. So you can name the first triangle however you want, but then the second triangle you have to um, have to match up the pieces so that someone looking just at this congruent statement could tell what angle is congruent to what angle, and also what what side is what congruent to what side. Side AB, that's the first two letters, that's going to be congruent to side FD, because those are the first two letters there, right? Okay. All right, so let's uh, look at what happens when we reflect over more than one line. So our first scenario, we're going to reflect um, over two parallel lines. Okay, so I've got this diagram here. All right, this says reflect F. Now, this isn't point F. It's just, think of it as a picture. It's just a drawing of the letter F, if you want to think of it like that. There's no dot there, right? So we're going to reflect F over line A and then over line B, okay? All right, so, um, let's zoom in a little bit here. All right, so uh, some people are really good at visualizing what this is going to look like. 
So, you know, you can kind of think of folding the uh, paper over line A, and then the F is going to flip over the line, and it's going to be kind of backwards over here somewhere, okay? But uh, for other people, that's really hard to, um, to imagine what that would look like. So I'm going to try to talk you through it if you're one of those people who has uh, trouble visualizing it. So I'm going to take the bottom of the F, so that point right there that I marked, okay? And I'm just going to try to think, well, where would the bottom end up if I reflected over line A? Well, what I'd want to do is I'd want to go to line A, so uh, at, a uh, at a perpendicular, um, along a perpendicular line, so I'm going the shortest possible distance from the bottom of the F to line A is like that, okay? And now, I didn't measure that with a protractor, but I could. And then um, what I want to do is continue that line out the same distance. So I could measure this distance right here. I'm just eyeballing it right now. Okay, so this is just to get it to give you a sense. But you know, we could get out measuring instruments. And what you'd want to do is is have you know the, those two segments be congruent to each other. So now I've reflected the bottom of the F. Okay, and now so I can do the same kind of thing with the other pieces like this piece. Right here, I can think, okay, I'm just kind of eyeballing this. It's going to end up somewhere like that, right? And same thing here. I don't know, something like that. And this is a little tricky, but I'm going to do the one back here. It looks like it goes right through that same thing, so I'm going to go a little further there. And now I've got the corners of this F, okay? And now I can draw this in. And I knew it was kind of going to flip backwards. And then I've got a, a, rough, uh, a rough reflection of that F over line A. Okay? So now I'm just going to repeat the process. I'm going to reflect this over line B. So I'm going to reflect this one over line B. Okay? I'll use a different color here. So I'm going to do the same kind of thing. And I'm just eyeballing here. So I'm thinking... left my ruler at school, so I wish I had one here, but I don't. Okay, something like that. And I don't know, something like this. And this is, I'm going a little farther with this one, so it's probably going to be a little messier. Um, who knows? And actually, just from, from what I have here, I kind of get a sense. So I, I reflected those two points, so this is going to be the back of my F. This is going to be the top. So without even reflecting that last point, I can I can make a pretty good guess how this is going to turn out now. Okay? And now I've reflected the picture of F over both of these um, both of these parallel lines. So my original lines are parallel, okay? And one thing you might notice when you did the first reflection, your F flipped. So that's one of the reasons I used an, an F instead of just reflecting like the letter, a capital letter A, because you wouldn't be able to see that it's backwards. But here I can see over, um, over that first line, it flips backwards, but then it flips right way again. So this has the same orientation as the original. Okay, I can read that as it's not a backwards F, it's right side up again. Okay, so if you think about this, going from that first F to the final one, it's, it's still facing the same direction. So you can kind of think of it just sliding from the first F to the last one. So it's a translation. So that's always going to happen when you reflect over parallel lines. So a reflection over two parallel lines is equivalent to a translation. Okay, it's always going to happen when you uh, when you reflect anything over parallel lines. Okay. All right. So let's move on to the next page. So this didn't. Oh man, that's hard to see, but um. There is a little bit of a grid. It printed out really light. Hopefully you can see it on your paper because I wanted that to show up. So we're going to reflect this point now. Okay, now I'm not, it's not a picture of the letter A. It's this point. It's just called point A. I'm going to reflect over line C. So it's hard to see here, but I can see that it's two units away on this little grid. So I'm going to go another two units over here. So here would be point A prime. That's, that means after one reflection. Okay, um, and then again, this is hard to see here, but I can see very faintly that it's three units away now from, from D, 
So I'm going to go another three units out on that side, okay? And then here is a double prime. So that's telling me that's after both reflections, okay? All right, so phase one complete. Reflect point A over line C and then over line D. So we did that, okay? Now let's compare the distance um, from, from line C to line D. Okay, line C to line D. So the distance between these two lines, well, if you can see the grid, you can count there are five units. So that's a distance of five. Okay, so this is five units. Okay, and then we want to compare that to the distance between A and A double prime. Okay, so if you count the, the boxes up from A to A prime, here's two, there's another two, there's three, there's another three. If you add them all up, it's going to be a distance of 10. Okay, so it's, uh, it's twice as big, right? The, compare the distance from line C to line, um, from line C to line D to the distance between A and A double prime. Um, well, 5 to 10. Okay, now that is not a coincidence. Um, that's always going to happen too. Okay, so if you reflect a point over two parallel lines, the distance between those two points is going to be twice the distance between the parallel lines you're reflecting over. Okay, so let's say that these were um, 50 units apart. Well, then the distance between the parallel lines is going to be 25. So, um, it's double. Okay, and that always happens. Okay, all right. So, um, there's reflecting over two parallel lines. Let's look at what is going to happen when we reflect over intersecting lines. Okay, so I'm going to reflect F. And this isn't point F, this is a picture of the letter F again, capital letter F. I'm going to reflect this over line A first. So here's line A. Okay, so that's pretty close set line. So just a little bit out that way. There's a corner. And I'll do this corner next. And I'm trying to just eyeball a perpendicular distance here. Okay, now that was the back of my F. So this should be the back of my F there. Okay. And then maybe, I mean, you can reflect the other corners if you want. But I can kind of see it's going to be flipped. Some, once you get the back of the F in, it's a little bit easier to draw in the rest of it. It's going to look something like that. Okay. Again, not using any measuring instruments, just a rough sketch of what's happening here. Okay. All right. So phase one complete. Now let's reflect this one over line B. So let me take this point here. Okay. I'll do this one as well. This one's pretty close. Okay, and this one is a little further than that. Something like this is a little harder to draw, but you should end up. It's still going to be an F, but it's kind of turned upside down, something like that, once you get it sketched in. Okay? These are all perpendicular distances. Okay, so you should end up with something that still looks like an F. It's just not not in the same, uh, not facing the same direction as the original. Okay, now um, if we look at this, let's compare the original F to to the red one after both reflections. Well, if I were to take if I were to rotate this page and have the intersection be the center of rotation, okay, so um, let's keep that black F in mind, and I rotate it like so, and now I've rotated it, sorry my hand was in the way there, but I've rotated this, and now I can see, oh, the F actually is readable as an F, it's facing the right direction, okay, so what this is from the first F to the last one, it's equivalent to a rotation about the intersection. Okay, so that's always, and I said parallel here, I meant perpendicular. I'll fix that. 
So a reflection over two perpendicular lines is equivalent to a rotation about the center, um, sorry, about the, um, the uh, intersection of the two lines. I'll just say a rotation about the intersection. Okay, and there's the moral of the story that happens every time with um, reflections over two intersecting lines. Okay. Okay, so let's move on to the next page. All right, so I've got a little fill in the blank thing here, but before I get to that, let's look at this. I'm going to kind of show you um, what the blank is or try to explain it by looking at this example, okay? So this says point A is reflected, uh, is a reflection of, so, sorry, A double prime is a reflection of, of A over, this should say line B and line C. I'll have to make an adjustment there. Okay, so we've reflected over here and then over there and we end up, um, we end up, that's after both reflections, okay? So it says find the angle of rotation. So we know that's going to be the same as ro a rotation. So um, you might be tempted to say, oh, well, hey, there's an 81 degree angle in there, so my angle of rotation is 81 degrees. Well, I understand that thinking, but that's actually incorrect. Okay, because when we're talking about the angle of rotation from A to A double prime, we're rotating about this intersection here, and you have to think about this as an angle that covers that whole distance. Okay, and I can see just by sketching in those lines that that's more than 81 degrees. Okay, how much more? Well, the good news is it's always going to be twice as much. Okay, so if you just take the angle in between the two intersecting lines and double it, that will give you the, um, um, the angle of rotation between the two um, reflected figures. Okay, so if this is 80, 81 degrees in here, this is going to be 81 degrees times 2, which would be 162 degrees. So it's not an 81 degree angle of rotation, it's actually 162 degrees. Okay, so if we go back up to um, this fill in the blank, it says when a figure is reflected over two intersecting lines, the angle of rotation from the original image to the fine, final one is twice the angle, or you could say double the angle between the intersecting lines. Okay. All right, so let's look at this last example. It's a similar kind of thing here. Um, except I forgot to write in what that angle was going to be between the two. So we don't have any information here. So um, let's say that this is, I mean, this is supposed to be given. Let's say that this is um, 120 degrees. Okay. So, and then we're told, hey, A has been reflected over those intersecting lines, one intersecting line, then the other. And this should say B and C. Okay. So, and then we're asked to find X, which is supposed to be the, um, the, um, the angle between those two lines. Okay. All right. So, hey, I know this, uh, if I double this angle, I'll get the 120 degrees. So that means X is going to be half of 120, which means it's going to be 60 degrees, okay? So there is the actual angle between the intersecting lines, even though the angle of rotation was 120 degrees. Okay, that's it for today.